the folks. So um, another cool, I think, application of these methods um, that um, a number of you in this room are particularly interested in is the application to predict species invasions, um, uh, invasive species, well, the big plants or any number of other invasives around the world. It's something I haven't myself um, really worked on, um, so this is a very quick overview of really looking at work that other, other folks have done, um, and uh, there's a couple of names up there, but thanks for providing me with the slide. So this is just a real quick introduction to how we can apply these models to um, uh, study and assess um, in invasive, invasive species. And here's a couple of key references that I've relied on for, for putting this together. Um, there's a growing literature out there, as I said, it's a very quick introduction, I'm just going to touch on it and point you in some directions, but here are two particularly, I think, useful ones. Um, one that Tam wrote uh, a few years old now, um, so, uh, you know, th th there's been huge developments in the techniques and the thinking since then, but it really sets out the basics of um, theory behind what we're trying to do with, it, with invasions. And then I think a really nice example, um, our colleague Wolf of Tullier, published back in 2005, that just is a, is a nice, neat example of, of, of modeling um, invasions. This is, I mentioned it earlier in the week, this is the uh, South African plants example. So just, just very quickly, and many of you know an awful lot more about this than me, but of course invasives are uh, a, a, a big problem around, around the globe, a problem for a number of reasons. They alter ecosystem functioning, they threaten native biodiversity, they have big impacts on agriculture, on forestry, um, on human health. Of course that kind of relates back to the last talk that we just had from, from town talking about um, uh, d diseases and disease vectors. So. Uh, we don't tend to think of them as invasive species, but it's, it's, it's all within this same context of, 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 of predicting from a few points to, to elsewhere in the landscape. Um, I'm sure you've been sick of these diagrams by now. You've seen towns bound diagrams uh, many, many times. And uh, I think this is maybe for this week, the last time I'll, I'll show you this one, but uh, it's one that, that, that I find particularly useful. Some of my colleagues have referred to this now as the potato diagram because, yes, because of, of, of these shapes. Anyway, this is the last time you'll see the potato diagram. But I'm coming back to it because just to emphasize and re emphasize, you know, we're now interested in this type of prediction. This is predicting into areas that we don't have current records for, and the species really isn't located there. So even if we go to this site now, we wouldn't find that the species is located there. It's outside its real true um, distribution. So the idea is that if we can identify that this is potentially suitable habitat, and if some, for some reason this dispersal barrier here breaks down, then this might be a, an ocean or you know, a, a stream or a river or a mountain range or whatever, the, 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 a, a lowland valley or something that's really just restricting um, uh, movement, again it comes back to this concept of M in terms of the band diagram, then this would be an area that we would say, well, if the species broke down that, that dispersal constraint, it actually moved to this area, then this would be an area where we would expect the species to, 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 to flourish. Okay? So let's look at, um, we're going to move on to some practical examples of, of, of exactly that. This is taken from, from, from Town's review, just to emphasise Again, we work in geographical space, we take our occurrence records, we then project that into, into ecological space, and this is where we characterize our ecological niche, that's where our ecological niche model is calibrated. And then what we're doing with these applications is not only projecting back to the native range, wherever that may be in the world, we're going to see, well, can we predict the native range? But importantly, we're going to take that same model and we're going to say, well, where else is that niche? Where else is that niche geographically distributed in other parts of the world, and particularly in, in, in areas where we're, we're, we're experiencing an invasion or we, we, we fear that an invasion may occur? You know, agricultural pest, for example. Now, just in one slide, this is again taken from, from Town's um, review. This is a, um, uh, a, a freshwater weed, I believe. 
Fibrilla the Salata? Is that a common name town? Is it? Fibrilla. Oh, sorry, okay. Fibrilla, yeah. Um, <coughs> big, big um, uh, pest throughout uh, many regions of the world, native to um, Southeast Asia and the Australo Pacific region. Um, so, what, what's been done here is take a few occurrence records, take as many occurrence records as we can find from the native range, calibrate the niche model. I think this is probably a dark model, but it could be Maxen, it could be Biofilm, it could be any number of these approaches. Calibrate on the native range, find as much information as we can to characterize the niche based on that area that the, the, the species has, has is, you know, its native range where it has inhabited for years, and then project that into another region, in this case, um, uh, North America. What you see here is the projection into North America with the darker areas showing high predictive suitability, and then it doesn't come out terribly clearly, but you'll be able to see in the paper or when you have these slides, these are the watersheds, showing these black polygons, black outlines that the species has actually known to have invaded. So what, what was done here was, let's take a, an invasion that's kind of already occurred, at least to, to, to a degree, it's, it's not a new invasion. Um, let's take the native range, predict the new range, and then let's see how well the, the invasion matches the, um, the, what, what we would expect based on this abiotic niche, on this ecological niche model. And you'll see, and it can be shown statistically, that there is a, a, a fairly good correspondence between the areas that are abiotically suitable, meaning that are comparable to the range, the, the, the native range, and the actual areas that have been invaded. So that's the, that's the general concept. And um, there are a few key considerations that we can discuss, but I just want to really flag, if you're interested in some of this work, here are some of the things that you need to be thinking about. We had a lot of discussion yesterday on this idea of niche conservatism. Is the niche really going to be con uh, con con conserved between the native range and the introduced range? The town put up a strong argument that in many cases that, that, that is going to be the case, but there's still a lot of debate about that. You want to think about that in your, um, uh, in your study, and, 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 and it's a key consideration if you're using these models, you're really going to kind of be assuming that the model is going to work if the range that it's going to invade is abiotically similar to the, the, the native range. That's what the model is going to tell you. It's related, but think about competitive release. Think about the biotic environment. There are examples, and, and, and there are, you know, in theory, you could expect that a species might be restricted to a certain part of its native range, but then put it on a whole other con continent in a whole other landscape. There may not be the competitors there. There may not be the same. Um, uh, uh, interactions with other organisms and there is potential um, that it could rapidly expand by out-competing um, the, the, the native um, flora and fauna. Here's just another key point um, that hopefully you won't fall into this trap but it's, it's important to mention. You, th these kinds of applications, really as in all these kinds of, 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 of niche modeling exercises, but it's particularly pertinent here where we're looking across broad geographic areas, you know, from one part of the world to another. The predictor variables that you use must have geographical consistency. And we've mentioned this already, but altitude is a, is a good example. Altitude is not a good variable to use because it's a proxy in, in almost all cases for other things. <coughs> Particularly, of course, for temperature. It correlates extremely um, strongly with temperature. But if you build your, mo your model using altitude, then well, the altitude at uh, one latitude and the altitude at another latitude might have extremely different temperatures, and it's really the temperature that your species is going to respond to. So your model in one region of the world might say, well, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the species likes an altitudinal range of six to 800 meters, but in another part of the world, the altitudinal range might be very, very different because it's not really the altitude it's responding to, it's the environment, for example, climate. So altitude would be a good example of a predictor variable that we kind of should never really use um, because it's not geographically consistent. Another example might be, you might have a variable, you might have some monthly climate data, you might have um, a variable like rainfall in April. Well, rainfall in April in one part of the world 
is going to be very, very different to rainfall in April in another part of the world because of seasonal differences. So that's why the biochem variables that you are working with this week, you know, we're ahead of that. In effect, the field is ahead of that, but um, you might not be, if you're generating your own data, then, then you need to think about this. Those variables aren't, for example, the, the mean temperature in um, January, February, March. They are the mean um, uh, temperature in, say, the, the hottest quarter, or the mean or the minimum precipitation in the wettest month. 